Hello and welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, a free safe space for people to share and learn from others' experiences with mental health and addictions. I'm Todd Runnebaum, suicide attempt survivor and a recovering substance abuser. It's summertime and life is crazy. There's a lot going on in my life right now, including moving to a new city uh, and, well, lots of other stuff. So because of that, I'm going to take a little bit of time off. But don't worry, there's still great content, including this episode. Over the next coming weeks, I will be featuring some of my friends' podcasts that I think you should check out. And also some past episodes that maybe you haven't listened to yet or they didn't get the love they deserved at the time. You know, not everyone's gone through and listened to every episode, so uh, they may not be new to me, but they could be new to you. So please sit back and enjoy past episodes and other great episodes from other great podcasters. I will be returning with all new episodes August 31st, and be prepared. There's going to be some amazing guests with amazing stories. Until then, keep listening and enjoy. This episode is with Robbie Seal. It's entitled, I Have Multiple Children with FASD, Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Disorder, and It's Mentally Hard for Everyone. It originally aired April 16th, 2022. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is a brain-based disability. It's basically a brain injury that comes from prenatal alcohol exposure. So what that means is, let me just read this. FASD is a diagnostic term used to describe the impacts on the brain and body of individuals prenatally exposed to alcohol. It's a lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder that occurs in all cultures, all levels of society, causing mild to severe impairment in physical, cognitive, sensory, and behavioral development. And that's from Can FASD. So Basically, um, the rates of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in Canada are, are quite high, really. It's 4% of the Canadian population, generally speaking. So, And there's some population groups or some demographics that have higher rates of FASD, but um, researchers are saying that our, generally our prevalence rate is 4%, which is one in every 25. So that's one in every classroom, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but it's a lifelong disability. And so if you think about one in 25, you and I and everybody listening knows somebody with FASD, even if they don't know it, because it's also a highly misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed disability, often gets miss, missed for an ADHD or a conduct disorder or autism. Um, and individuals who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder have a very high occurrence of having other mental health challenges. In fact, 93% of people who have FASD also have other mental health issues. So it's a really high correlation, which is why I was really excited to talk to you um, on the show. So how, how is it different than, say, autism? Because autism, too, they there's probably 90% of people with autism also have another you know, ADHD or OCD or whatever. Exactly. Very similar. So with, because, you know, both autism and FASD are both brain-based neurodevelopmental disabilities. So if you want to put that down in a layman's terms, it would be that they're individuals who have FASD and or autism, their brains are wired differently. So that's going to have impacts on how, um, on how their brain develops and what their neurochemistry is, right? We know that depression, uh, if it's not situational depression, then it's a neurochemical imbalance. Well, that can occur if there's prenatal toxins that impact that developing brain, right? And that those toxins can be alcohol. That's a very highly probable because we know that 80% of women of childbearing years drink alcohol. And we know that 50 to 60% of pregnancies are unplanned. So there's a really high rate of high probability that there are babies prenatally exposed to alcohol before mom even knows that she's pregnant. Like we know that no mom does this intentionally. Um, it's, it's just what can happen if there's alcohol during pregnancy. Even if it's just once? Well, the policy is no safe amount at any time. Right. And once what? One drink one time or one binge one time, mm -hmm. right? And what about those 
four, six, eight weeks before, or maybe even nine weeks before that mom knows she's pregnant. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And maybe she goes to a wedding one weekend and has a few cocktails. And then maybe she has a mom's or a lady's night out one night and has a few cocktails. Those would be categorized as binge drinking, right? If you have, if a woman has four ounces of alcohol within a small amount of time, that's a binge. Hmm. And those are highly dangerous for that developing embryo. I, I mean, I've heard many, many, many women who, you know, once they found out they were pregnant, stopped drinking, obviously, and they were trying for kids and stuff. And then they're like, oh, he, he, he. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. It was like, I think the one time it was a wedding, it was like, oh, is that so and so's wedding? And yeah. Yeah. Like, a week and later, so we I, hope- was, I was positive. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So a week ago, we were at somebody's wedding. And what about the week before that and the week before that? So if it's at one time and there's that binge, that's something that's important to know, not panic. There's no, don't panic, but that's important to know about. And make sure you talk about that with your physician and talk about that with the doctor, with your OBGYN when you're moving, you know, that way. And they may say there's nothing to worry about. And there may not be, but also uh, general physicians and OBGYNs and pediatricians are not trained in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, there's, there's very little, there may be a brief conversation about FASD in medical school. And that's all it is about a paragraph. Yeah. My, I, my cousin's husband is an ER doc and he and I were talking about this and he practices in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And, uh, we were talking about this and he said, Robbie, in all my years of medical school and all my years of specializing, I think there was like maybe a, a couple hour seminar on it. That was it. That was all. So what would a, so there, what would a doctor tell a woman then that was that, you know, she did go to a wedding or whatever. And then she told her doctor, like, would they, what would they tell her anyway? Then if they don't even know what they're talking about, they would say it's probably no big deal. And there's still doctors who advise women. Sure. Having a drink once in a while is not going to hurt. Have a glass of wine. It'll help you relax. Doctors are still saying that. So women get a lot of mixed messages. Yeah. I've even heard, you know, do, well, I've heard women tell me that it was okay to smoke pot once in a while while pregnant because it helps with their nausea and stuff. Not true. Yeah, exactly. See, these are the misinformations that are out there and we get them from our mixed sources, maybe for our friends, our relatives, social media. But really, the st- there are now studies coming out that are showing how dangerous cannabis is to that developing baby. Right. Hmm. I guess the other side of the mental health aspect, I mean, for severely FASD children, it's the parents having to, you know, care for someone who's, uh, is it considered a disability? It is a disability. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, having to raise a child with a disability, I'm, I'm assuming that, because I've, I've done an episode already on autism, so I'm assuming it's very similar to, to that. Well, some of the stressors are very much the same, very much so. Children, infants with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder can have a great deal of difficulty being overstimulated and being startled and not sleeping well, inconsolable, having feeding problems, having sleeping problems, having inability to attach well to the, to the parent, whether that's a biological parent or a foster or adoptive parent. And that's because of the changes in the brain development so that the baby may not be, the, those parts of the baby's brain may not able able to do what they need to do. And so if a parent is struggling with all of those things, the baby's not eating well, not sleeping well, is having respiratory challenges. As one of my children did, I was in the ER with him all the time. There's a lot of stress. And then when you go to the doctor and say, my child was prenatally exposed to alcohol, uh, they go that they don't even write it down on the chart. Like, okay, no big deal. So you're always going, you're always kind of working against the system. And as a parent, you're desperately looking for answers and there's, it's hard to find the answers. Hmm. Are, do you have a child with FASD? I have five children and I have three of them are diagnosed with FASD. Are they, you're, like, were they adopted or are they, are you the biological mother? Good question. Um, I have one biological daughter and I have four adopted children and they all were prenatally exposed to alcohol, drugs, and trauma. Is that why so you adopted them or, or um, why they were up for adoption? Yeah, they were, they were in foster care. They were either in foster care or they were in the custody of the government. And it was my desire, my heart. I wanted to adopt children from foster care because I know that they needed permanency and they needed a family. And in your podcast, what's it called? FASD Family Life. I knew that. 
<laughs> I was you were just testing me to see if I knew it. <laughs> so what what are the some of the different episodes you talk about like cuz I mean it it's a fairly niche subject so um what what are some of the some of the guests or some of the episodes that you can talk about? Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking me. Yeah. The podcast is actually one years old. I just started it in March 2021, so I'm celebrating my anniversary. This is, uh, I've been doing it for about a year as well. Yeah, congratulations. It's a Thank lot you. of fun and it's a lot of work. Um, I have 62 episodes out so far and yeah, I'm just busting it out. Yep, weekly. And I have over 17,000 downloads worldwide. So while it's a niche market, FASD is rampant everywhere. So I have listeners in Israel. I have listeners in Slovakia. I have listeners in Brazil, Germany, uh, Denmark. I've had people, uh, South Africa has a really high rate. Um, so I've had people all over the place reach out to me uh, for encouragement and more FASD education. So I started, my podcast started because I know how hard it is. I know how hard it is to raise children with a disability, a disability that they, it's a physical disability because it's in their brain, but they look typical. So physicians expect normal from them. Educators, teachers, principals, bus drivers expect them to behave as a child of that age would. And children with FASD cannot because they have a brain injury. So they have slower cognitive pace. They have anxiety. They, ha they are less mature. They are developmentally delayed by at least half their age. So if you have a 14 year old with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, he, she's got all the hormones and interests of a 14 year old, and they're only developmentally six or seven. Imagine the risk. Imagine how easily they could be taken advantage of and also how unable they would be to keep up in school at that level. So I have a vast amount of experience, over 20 years experience raising kids with FASD. I know how hard it is. I've had a lot of training. And so I wanted to, and I always wished I had a friend who understood I always wished I had a friend who, who just maybe had five years experience on me, somebody I could turn to when I don't know what the next right step is. That's what motivated me to take, to uh, start the podcast. So I could be that friend to that mom, that dad, that auntie, that grandma, who just does not know what is the next right step or doesn't understand FASD. I can teach and I can encourage. Hmm. I suppose the only thing you're missing is maybe the guilt of a biological mother raising uh, someone with FASD. Yeah. Ab absolutely. There's a lot of stigma around with this disability because even as I've talked about, let's say my children, I'll just say my children, because I don't differentiate my adopted child from my biological child. They're all mine. I'm fierce mama bear over all of them. It doesn't matter to me. But when I'm talking to somebody, educating them about FASD, and I say my children are prenatally exposed to alcohol, people are like, oh, <laughs> and they're trying to assess if I would have done that. Well, that's so wrong because, you know, there, you know, I'm, I'm over 50 now, so I'm not of that age, but you know, a very high rate of people who have children with fetal alcohol are college educated women. If you think back to college or trade school, all the drinking that was happening there and all the uh, sex that's happening in that age group, they're at a really high risk of having children. Mm -hmm. And then as they move on, and then you've got this wine mom night or this, you know, ladies night out. I mean, the whole alcohol industry is really pinked up, you know, in the last several decades. And so women's drinking has matched up to men's drinking. There used to be a really big difference in how much men and women would drink. And now it's pretty equal. But women have that additional vulnerability of if they're carrying a baby, that baby could be impacted. Mm -hmm. So, yes. And women, women who have realized you know, after the fact, or have realized that, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant and I was drinking. There's so much fear and there's so much shame. And then perhaps they didn't know at all. Perhaps if they were in addiction, you know, addiction's a beast. You know that, I know that. Um, there, maybe they weren't able to stop while they were pregnant and then they carry all that guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. I don't want that for them. There are agencies across Canada there to help those women, support women who are raising kids with FASD or ki women who have substance use uh, issues. Please get support. Please, please get understanding. And there are agencies in your city to help you and help your children. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't, I mean, I can't lie. I've, I'm probably uh, part of the stigma and part of the, the judging too. It's what, yeah, when you hear someone with FASD, it's like, oh boy, 
but what was that mom doing yeah the heck at the same time you know my wife i she may i i don't remember if she drank when she was pregnant before she found out she was pregnant or not i probably but I was hammered all the time when she was pregnant. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. If I was yeah. a woman, that would be hell. Like, I don't, I, yep. I don't know how I would have handled getting pregnant. That I. Well, would you have even been aware? Because too, if you're hammered all the time, if you're, if a woman is drinking alcohol all the time, or or using drugs, using meth, using coke, using whatever she's using, mm-hmm. how aware is she of her monthly cycles? Are her monthly cycles regular? Have they been impacted? How's right. her nutrition and how's her mental health? All of those things, mom's health, that woman's health impacts the baby. We know even women that are under extreme stress during their pregnancy, under toxic stress, um, have a higher probability of having a child with ADHD. Really? So if she has a partner who's drinking alcohol, who's hammered all the time, uh, that's, I mean, the, the genetics and the epigenetics and the factors from that father, the quality of that sperm impact the development of that baby. And then if she's in chronic stress all the time, that impacts the, the quality of health of that baby, that embryo that's developing. And then is she pressured to drink because her partner's drinking? Some women are. Is she partner? Is she pressured to drink so that she is like one of the girls or one of the family? Because sometimes when people quit drinking, they get shamed by their family, right? Like, what, are you better than us now? You don't drink anymore. You think you're all that. So then there's pressure to keep drinking. So there's a lot of factors that could go into it. So completely unknowingly, a woman, a couple could be harming their developing baby because they just don't know the risk. They just don't know the risk. And so then, you know, and oftentimes, um, as it was from my, I've got three, I have four children prenatally exposed to alcohol. Um, one of them I adopted when she came to me as a three years old. So I don't know what her infancy was like, other than I know it was very traumatic, but I don't know developmentally what she was like. I have twins that I adopted at five months old and they were develop, developing just a little bit slower than, than maybe typical, but um, they were not problematic. They were really easy babies. They were lovely toddlers. Then they began school. Kindergarten was fine. Grade one, by a few months into grade one, I got a comment from the teacher that they're failing school. By grade two, it was a complete washout. And that's often what we see as individuals, children who have been prenatally exposed to alcohol, marijuana, other drugs, uh, toxic stress, that by the time they're in grade one, that's when we start to see some challenges, even more in grade two and grade three, because, you know, it's not hard to be a preschooler. You just show up and play and do what you do. And nobody really has any expectations on you, but you go to grade, you go to grade one. And suddenly the teacher's expecting you to be able to sit still for 20 minutes. Well, a child with FASD probably can't do that. Um, in grade one, they're expecting you to follow instructions, maybe even a two or three step instruction, like, okay, Johnny, time to sit in your chair, get out your book. And we're going to start working on math. Well, Johnny who was FASD doesn't know what you just said. Cause that's a three step instruction. Mm. Johnny who was FASD can only handle a one step instruction. So these kids get lost and then they start showing problems in school. And then maybe they get labeled as ADHD because they're always wiggling around all the time. And so they might get an ADHD diagnosis. Then in grade two or three, maybe they get a learning disability diagnosis. And then, my gosh, they're getting really challenging and difficult when they're 10, 11, 12 years old. So then then maybe they get an oppositional defiant disorder diagnosis. But what hasn't been asked most of the time, what has not been asked by the doctors who are assessing or the social workers as any chance that this child was exposed to alcohol prenatally, what was your pregnancy like? You know, what was your pregnancy like? Was your partner drinking? Were you drinking? Was there a lot of stress in the home? And if we could ask those questions, we would find that there is a high rate of prevalence of FASD in in our schools. And you know what? These kids don't grow out of FASD. These become our teenagers. These become our, our people who really have a hard time fitting into society and finding what's right for them. And then these are adults who have FASD and they have complex needs and complex mental health challenges and they fall between the cracks. Hmm. So how can a doctor tell the difference between someone that has ADHD or autism or FASD? First question is to ask, was there prenatal alcohol exposure? That's the first question to ask because a lot of people, I'm just trying to wrap my head around the statistic for ADHD, but there's a very high prevalence of individuals who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder have ADHD, very, very high correlation, 
very high correlation. There's also a high correlation. It's not as high. Like I think that's in the 90s percent. It's also a very high correlation between individuals who have FASD also have autism. Hmm also have learning disabilities, also have a whole host of other medical challenges, cleft lip and palate, scoliosis, GERD, the suck, swallow, breathe uh, dysfunctions, um, gestation or, or digestive challenges, all related to that prenatal alcohol exposure because the body, the baby, the baby is developed from the, and the brain from the bottom up and from the inside out. So if you think about the whole midline of your body, that's what develops first. Even in those first few months, maybe before mom is even know she's um, pregnant, right? And what's first to develop is that brainstem. And so what does brainstem do? It does all those automatic things you don't know about. And that like regulating your emotions. Individuals with FASD, <clears throat> sorry, have a great deal of challenge regulating their emotions, staying in a calm state. So other than asking, is there other tests or tells, you know, FASD symptoms are extremely similar to autism or, or to ADHD. What are some of these other tells or other, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I do know (laughs) what you mean. I do know what you mean. And what I'm just going to reach over for, because I know you can edit this out later. I'm going to reach over and get a sheet of paper. Okay. So the primary symptoms of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, let's go over those primary symptoms of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. First of all, can be, but is not always the size of this baby. But we also know that babies exposed prenatally to to nicotine, to smoking are small and they have risk of, of, of breathing problems and developmental problems. So we know that also children, babies who are prenatally exposed to alcohol can be small for their age. They may have a small head circumference. So the size of their head, they may have, um, changes to the folds of their eyes. They may have a flat bridge and wider set eyes. They may have low set ears. They may have no, you know, that bow you have here, that, that little Cupid's bow it's called. Yep. Yeah. Check that. Yeah. Yeah. You've got one. <laughs> individuals, some individuals with FASD don't have that and they have a very flat lip. And so we look for that sometimes, but that's actually a misnomer because only 7% of people who have FASD have those characteristics. So we say if a person has FAS, FAS is the, has the facial features, but 93% of people who, who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder look completely typical. They may even be of a typical stature. They have the typical looking face. So when we look at them, there's nothing we can see. But if we spend a little bit of time with them, we do begin to see that they have cognitive delays. They don't, so thinking is really hard. They are unable to learn from consequences. So when you're giving your child a timeout and you're giving your child a talking to, or you're taking away privileges, you know, you jumped on the couch. Now you can't sit on the couch or you won't shut off the GameCube. So tomorrow you can't have GameCube. Well, you can do those things, but our kids with FASD won't learn from that. So that these are the kids who keep making the same mistake over and over and over again without learning. These kids are really reactive to stress because the alcohol has damaged their own stress response system so that they are always revving at really high and they can't, it seems like they can't handle any frustration and then they boil over. But really what it is, is their whole stress response system has been changed and damaged by prenatal alcohol exposure, as well as the stress the mother was under. Um, So they are, they're just right at the boil point and they just react a lot to stress. Um, They have typically part of the uh, profile is receptive language delays so that they don't hear as fast as you're speaking. And as you're talking, they may not be able to file away where that needs to go in the memory to into the brain to retrieve it later because they don't hear everything. They don't understand everything and they don't know where to file it in their brain. Also, individuals with FASD have working memory challenges. So that's where I'm holding on to the question you just asked me, and then I'm working through my brain to think, what is it that you want me to tell you? And I can do that because I'm working with what you told me, and I'm doing that. Same with like math problems. You know, I'm given these numbers, and now I have to hold the numbers in my head, and I have to manipulate them around and be, to give you an answer. That's why math is so hard for some people with FASD. So you can see why there's learning disabilities. There's also sensory processing challenges. I don't know if you've ever heard that word before. Uh, sensory processing. Uh, yeah. 
I kind of have those issues myself, and I'm not diagnosed with anything. <laughs> and I'm not here to diagnose you, but, F, <laughs> but since, but I could, but, you know, we could have a conversation later. But sensory processing. So if you think about your five senses, your sight, your smell, your taste, your your sound, your touch, all of those things have the all of the information from your world. The stimuli comes in, let's say, through your eyes. So I'm looking at you. It's going in through my eyes, going to the back of my head. It's being processed, and then I can understand who I'm talking to and what what's going on. I can also hear other sounds in the background and I can feel the touch of my sweater. Well, if I have, but I can integrate all those things and I can be balanced and I can still focus on what I need to focus on, which was that question you asked me and I'm working out the answer and I'm giving you an answer. A person who has a sensory processing disorder may not be able to do that because some of these senses that are coming into them cannot go where they need to go in the brain and then and also, even if they do, they may not be able to be balanced and, and keep the balance of what actually needs to be happening. So, for example, some people with FASD are very sensitive to things, very sensitive to the touch. And so something like this sweater would be way too itchy and they wouldn't even be able to concentrate on school or even on this question because maybe the tag on the back of their sweater is just driving them. So, you, we've all had that, though. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we all have sensory processing. Mm -hmm. But you know, you've got that tag on the back of your sweater and you're like, oh, I can't think right now. Well, that can be the everyday, every moment of experience of a person with FASD, mm -hmm. along with thinking challenges, along with receptive language challenges, right? So there's a lot going on. And that's just a few of them. There's there's more, but it gives you a sense of this is an important disability. Mm -hmm. You were going to say? <laughs> well, I was going to say, and all the while look completely typical. And so you, dad, are giving this child an, uh, you know, instruction or asking them a question and they're nodding their head. Yep, I got it. I understand. But then they can't do what you were asking to do because they couldn't process all those words. They can't get their memory to work this time. And maybe the, the tag or the seam on their sock is just everything they can think about right now. Mm -hmm. And so this is the challenge that they get. So these kids look like they're just on purpose, not behaving on purpose, not listening. And so parents get really frustrated because it looks like really oppositional behavior. So if some of these uh, disabilities are so similar, are they, is the treatment for them similar? Um, there's no treatment for FASD. No. There is some. There's some treatment for for ADHD. There's some cognitive behavioral therapy that can help individuals with ADHD. There's medication. Mm -hmm. I have a study here that I was just going to pull up. So there there are uh, medications to help individuals who have ADHD, mm -hmm. and those medications are very successful al along with learning some strategies and learning some cognitive behavioral therapy. Individuals with ADHD always have ADHD, but there are some su supports that can really, really help. Now, individuals who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and ADHD also often are prescribed ADHD medications. They may dim it down a bit, but it's really not all that helpful. Hmm. And cognitive behavioral therapy, talk therapy does not work with individuals with FASD because it's all auditory based. And it's at that working memory and that processing all these words and also that taking the time to reflect on my own behavior and what I could do differently. Well, individuals with FASD are generally unable to do those things because they, they are concrete thinkers. They see the world, but they can't really in, look inside and abstract Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder what that was, you know, so it's really a challenge. Something I've just heard of recently is there are some people that have no internal dialogue at all. Is that something that people with FASD have trouble with? You know, like, you know, I can have a full conversation in my head where some people just, there is no internal dialogue, dialogue at all. It literally is what's in front of them and what's happening and what Could they're be. Could be for some, because again, you know, it's a spectrum disorder, right? right? So it could be for some. An internal dialogue in terms of like playing out how a conversation would go? Yeah. No, because that's abstract reasoning. No, that's not possible. Hmm. Um, so like individuals with FASD generally have a really hard time abstracting, think, predicting. If I say this, then my dad will say that. Or if I do this, then this will happen. I mean, really, uh, an individual with FASD is going to predict that I'm going to ask for this and my dad's going to, so my son is going to say, mom, can I play, you know, can I play Call of Duty tonight? I'm like, no, you're not 18. You're not playing Call of Duty. And he's going to flip his lid and be all upset because I said no. Mm -hmm. Happens all the time because he's just not expecting that I'm going to say no. Mm. Or, you know, that kind of thing. Or if he... um 
you know, it's really, let's say he's playing with a friend and he, or playing, yeah, playing with a friend, hits his friend with a, gets mad, hits his, hit, hits his friend with a hockey stick. He's not going to then think that, oh my gosh, now my friend isn't going to want to play with me anymore. Right. He's, because it's very much living in, and not that he's ever done that, he hasn't, but like very much just living in the moment too. Individuals with FASD get really over, get really reactive. And I've talked about why that is that HPA axis, that stressor, stress response system in the body. And they get really overreactive also sensory processing overwhelm, but once they're done, they're done because they don't hold that on because they live in the moment. They don't hold on to that. So this is the kid who's just F-bombed you. They've just raged at you. They've just, whatever they've done, throw chuck stuff all over the classroom. And now they're like, they're calm and they're regular. And now they had recess and they come back in and everything's good. And you're like, and you're still stressed out, freaked out and mad at them. And they're like, but I'm being good right now. Mm-hmm. And they really mean it. I, I'm being good right now. So you can see how individuals like this who are overrepresented in the Canadian uh, criminal justice system, you can see how they would get stuck in there because they don't understand what's happening. They don't understand the conditions of release. So they breach all the time because they don't understand because that language is way too complicated. And what if you can't tell time? And what if you don't have supports helping you? You breach, you breach, you breach. Or you overreact, let's say you're in custody and you overreact and you assault a, a, another inmate or you assault a corrections officer. Well, now you've got more and more charges on you, but it was actually a symptom of your disability. It wasn't actually a willful choice. You didn't reason it out whether, geez, I wonder if, you know, doing this right now, breaking into a fight with somebody is actually going to help me or hurt me. There's no ability to do that. Right. So they don't, there's, they always forget what the consequences are are going to be or were at one other time, right? Well, or just not available to them in the moment. Like hmm. maybe they know they right. can might be some, sometimes even say like, if I do this and this is going to happen, maybe, but maybe not, but it doesn't work. You know how, you know, okay. If I'm, you know, you know, if you speed, there's a good chance, maybe a 50% chance that the cops are going to pull you over. So you have that voice in your head going, is it worth it? Is it not worth it? That's what individuals with FASD lack is that reasoning about like, okay, this could happen. And is it worth it? First of all, they may not know what could happen. They may not remember. They may not remember what the impact would be, but they also lack the ability to reason. So how do you, I guess, discipline someone with FASD, especially in like, especially adults in the judicial system? Well, thankfully, there are a few courts that are um, mitigating some of that. And I think it's Jordan's there's Jordan's principle, which helps for providing services for people with FASD. There's something that helps. I don't know if it's Jordan's principle that helps courts, but it's certainly part of the TRC recommendations. There's the truth and reconciliation recommendations. Uh, One of them is to consider fetal alcohol spectrum disorder as it relates to an individual and their culpability and their, what would be a reasonable response to the crime that they've committed. So that's one thing there. Um, There is in Manitoba, they have FASD court. It's the only province in Alberta that I'm aware of. Manitoba has FASD court. So that's really helpful because what, what that can do too, is it can be aware of that FASD is a brain injury, but it also can change the language for the people. So that if you're standing before a judge, the judge has a different script, a different way of communicating to the individual what their breach, what their conditions are. And then the conditions can be, can be written at a more appropriate level that the person can actually understand. So those are some of the accommodations that can be made. Hmm, interesting. What punishments, what punishments can be levied to help a person learn their lesson or do better? Doesn't work that way because they have mm-hmm. a brain injury. Right. So in so that so you can see why as a parent how stressed out you would be. Bunny hugs and mental health is supported by Co-op. I've been a member of my local Co-op, Sherwood Co-op, for about twenty years. If you live in Western Canada, especially the prairies, or spend any time here. You've probably fueled up or bought groceries at a co-op. You might even have a co-op number, or two, or three. You know if you know. But co-op is not just a gas bar or a grocery store. Although co-op is those things too, it's a different kind of business. Co-op members are owners and success is shared with everyone. Your co-op doesn't benefit one person or one corporation. Your co-op was built for everyone. Your co-op was built for your community. Learn more about co-op and find a location near you at co-op.crs. 
One thing I've learned through my experience with mental health and addictions is you never know what you need to hear until you hear it. Make sure to rate and review on Apple and to tell as many people as you can about the podcast so others can hear something they need to hear from one of my guests. After all, this is a free mental health service, which is a rare thing, so why not share with as many people as you can? And you got right, three of you're... them. I have, yeah, I have three of them. I have four actually prenatally exposed, but one isn't diagnosed. Um, and she had a she had a long history in addiction, about 10 years in addiction too. So that's also prevalent within this um, community. Um, but so what do you do differently? Like, let me tell you, I was so stressed out when I would use all my best parenting, you know, and I already had, I already had years of parent, a decade of experience parenting before I adopted my little twins and uh, nothing I tried worked. And, you know, and I was even a child youth care worker before. So I have like the parenting I grew up with and I have all the parenting strategies I learned in college and none of it worked. All those sticker charts, no. Timeouts, No. It uh, doesn't work. So what we have to do is recognize, okay, my kid has a brain injury. So if my kid had a physical disability, if my kid suddenly lost the use of their legs, would I still expect them to be mobile? Would I still expect them to get around the world the way they did before? No, that's ludicrous, right? I would build a ramp in my house. I would widen the doorways. I'd have a wheelchair. I'd lower light switches. So, so it's at their level so they could do stuff. Same with FASD. This is a physical disability. So we have to change our environment and our expectations so the kids can do as best as they can still with that brain injury. So what I learned to do is have very tight structure in our home. We do, we have a very tight structure of how our home works because our kids can't predict. Remember that part? They can't predict. They can't remember. So then you're filled with anxiety because you don't know how the world works. So structure is everything. And then I learned how to build little mini routines and even put them in picture form because my kids are really little, but, and, and kindergarten teachers do this all the time. You know, we're going to do this and this and this in the order of the day. I learned to do that for my kids and that was transformative. So I have structure. Okay. This is how the day goes. And this is how our family works every single day. And then I built in routines to help my kids get through those daily tasks, like even getting ready for school that were so very hard. And it's really, really important for an individual who has FASD. It doesn't matter if they're a little child, um, a preteen, a teen, an adult. And I, I know many adults with FASD, they need routines because otherwise the world is too chaotic and unpredictable. So routine is everything. And with routine, that prevents a lot of behavior because the child knows what to do. Again, individuals with FASD can't abstract. They can't know what to do if someone hasn't told them precisely what to do, especially in childhood. So what does discipline look like then for someone with FASD? We don't discipline. No. We very seldom discipline because you know what? It, would you discipline a child? Would you would you discipline a child who can't read because they they don't have glasses? If I take off my glasses, you're a blur. And so I can try really hard. I can focus and I can try really, 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 really hard to see you. And I still can't see you. So am I going to get disciplined for that? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. This kid has a brain injury. Right. They don't know what to do when they don't know what to do. They do get overwhelmed. And so when they get all overwhelmed and they're yelling and they're freaking out and they're smashing walls, you can discipline them, but you're disciplining a physical disability that's inhumane. So what we have to do is try to... Keep prevent our kids from getting there. That's the best thing you can do is prevent. Sometimes we can't. So if if the storm is flying, if if the storm is flying in your home, the best thing you can do is stay calm. And we know that yelling, get stay calm, calm down. <laughs> we know that, like, I mean, we've all tried that. Calm down. It doesn't work. So what you have to do is be really calm as a parent and say something like, I see this is hard for you. What do you need right now? with your arms open wide. And I don't care if this kid is three, five or 17, like my twins are. I see this is hard for you. My arms are open wide. And I don't say that just, I see this is hard for you. What do you need right now? Hmm. And they will come in for a hug, even though they're 17 years old. And if they don't, that's okay. Because maybe touch isn't a good thing right now. That's okay. And they'll, they'll let me know. I just need time alone. Okay. Then I do. And there's no discipline for talking to me like that. There's no discipline for swearing at me. 
And it, honestly, it doesn't happen very much in my home. They don't, they yell. Yeah. But they don't swear at me very much, but I can go to them later and go, you know, that F bomb that hurt me and they'll say sorry, but I can't do that in the moment. So it's really about, we call it co-regulating too, co-regulating. So I use my calm just by proximity, being close to them to help them calm down. I also validate their feelings. I don't tell them to calm down. I don't say stop being upset. I say something like, I see this is hard for you. I see you're stressed out. And as soon as you say that to somebody, they feel seen and heard. Mama. I'm in a recording. He's on the corona. My kids are home now too. <laughs> um, as soon as, you know, as soon as you feel seen and heard, you can kind of drop your shoulders and take a breath. And that's, what's really important. Um, kids, kids with FASD, individuals with FASD can be very, very, very impulsive. Parents really struggle when our kids get into that phase where they steal and our kids do steal. But what we have to learn to remember is that this is impulsivity and this is not being able to understand that concept of ownership. Remember, I talked about can't understand concepts, very concrete thinking. So any kind of teaching you're going to do about stealing, and I try them all and failed miserably, uh, it just is so exasperating. But so what we have to do is prevent. We prevent by close supervision of our children so they don't have the opportunity. Um, maybe having clothes that don't have pockets. So it's a lot harder to steal in the store or steal at your friend's house or steal at school if you don't have pockets. Um, so there's a lot of prevention things that parents can do. When I did the, the episode about autism, the, the, I talked to the child and the parents, and the parents mentioned that sometimes they get judged by other parents is is that have you ever experienced absolutely because you know they're like yes. why don't you just spank him or why don't you yell at him or why don't you do this why don't you do that and like when my kid yeah. did this i do this and and they think oh, you're yeah. too soft on them or something absolutely you're either you're a helicopter parent because you're always supervising so you've got to let your kids try they've just got to be regular kids and you you don't have to be at the skate park when they're 15 years old and you're like oh hell yeah i do have to be at the <laughs> skate park when they're 15 years old i don't have to acknowledge that that's my child and he doesn't have to acknowledge that i'm his mom but i still have to be there Right. Otherwise, he's vaping with the stoners or he's doing whatever with the stoners that are there. Right. Because any idea is a good idea because you can't weigh. Right. And that Cause and effect, you can't Impulsivity weigh. and whatever Impulsivity, else. Impulsivity, yeah. wanting to fit in. I mean, we were all teenagers. We all did stuff, right? But, but also our kids are at really high risk of developing an addiction because of their brain injury, because of their genetics, because of their predisposition. So we have to watch them. But is there judgment? Yeah, of course, because who even knows about FASD? Yeah. So few people. And you keep referring to autism, and I love it that you do. FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, is two and a half times more common than autism. That we know of. How many are misdiagnosed? How many are misdiagnosed? Exactly. But with the current rate of 4% prevalence, that is two and a half times more prevalent than autism is. After I use this macaroni, we're out. So that's a huge, like, that's a huge stat. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, just like autism, sometimes you can't tell that an individual has autism. Right. You know, not till maybe you start chatting with them a little bit and you start like, hmm. But at first you don't, especially when you see them in the store and maybe you see them stimming, you see them rocking, or maybe they're blowing a fit or they're saying the same word over and over and over again. Our kids can do that too. FASD kids might do that too, or kids with FASD might do that too, or blow a fit in the store or be swearing at you in the store or carrying on or, or refusing to do homework. Well, they're refusing to do homework because they are exhausted. Think about all those brain impairments and all that anxiety and all that ADHD and all of that at school, then the kid comes home, they've got nothing left to do. And yet Mrs. Teacher is expecting them to still do home reading and math sheets or write an essay. And the kid is just going to blow up because they really cannot do it. And that is not oppositional defiant. That is exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And so, but when you know that, when you know that, then you don't even worry about what other parents say anymore. You're like, I've got this. I wasn't asking for your opinion. But it's really, really hard, especially if you've got people in your own families, and most people do, have people with their own family who don't understand. Sometimes the, their partners don't understand. So you've got dad and mom saying different things or mom and mom saying different things. A grandma's don't understand, grandpa's aunties, uncles, all this judgment. And so it's a very 
isolating life. And same as it is for families who have autism, autism in their families, it's very isolating because it's not safe. It's not emotionally safe to be around other people who are going to be judgmental and harsh, ignorant to your child, harmful to your child. You're like, I'm not putting myself in that situation. So it's incredibly lonely work. You don't fit in at school. You don't fit in like the child and you as a parent don't fit in at school. Parent Teachers assume that you are the problem because your child doesn't behave that way at school. So it's just you. You must be a really bad parent. Um, you're probably not, you know, you're just indulging them. You're feeding them too much sugar. You let them stay up late. Like whatever they think is happening, all this judgment. And um, yeah. And then you don't, if you go to church, you don't fit in at church because your child is the one who's going to drop an F-bomb right in front of the pastor, Right been there, done that. Um, your child is the one who's going to be saying all kinds of crazy stuff in, in, um, Sunday school or not being able to keep up, not being able to read. So they'll be acting out behavior because you know what? Nobody wants to look stupid, mm-hmm. right? If nobody wants to look stupid, you're going to, you're going to try to be funny or you're going to try to be defensive rather than look stupid, right? Especially kids, but all of us, none of us wants to look stupid. So we put up this other false front that looks like, what does it look like? Being a clown, being defiant, being difficult. And that's not what's happening. So as a parent, what do you do for your mental health when it comes to all this stuff? Yeah. And I've been at the breaking point several times, several times, because this is a really hard road. And my oldest child is 30 and my youngest is 14. So I've been parenting for 30 years already. And given that my son has a disability, I'm probably going to be parenting for another 10 years, really intense. So that's really hard. So what I've done is I've taken a lot of training in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So I understand what I'm dealing with and I continue to take training and have coaching that really helps because it reframes this from being so damn difficult to, okay, this is a disability. This is what the trajectory looks like helps. It really helps. Um, I have a mental health therapist that I meet with regularly which is extremely important. Um, I have at times sought mental health therapy for my children as well. Didn't really help, but I've, I've tried. Um, and I have worked really hard to educate my family about FASD. And I'm really fortunate that my husband came on a lot of the training with me. So he speaks the same language I speak. He, he looks through the same lens as I look through in terms of this is a disability. Like this isn't a defiant kid. This is a child who's not understanding what I need right now or not understanding how they're supposed to behave right now. So that really helps. Um, and then I have a, I have a support group, uh, a mom group that I'm a part of, and it's key because we are all raising children who are adopted and all these children have been prenatally exposed to alcohol. And all of these children are having a really hard time in life and we're having a really hard time. And so we have each other for support and encouragement. Hmm, perfect. That was my next yeah. question. Is there support groups for parents? There are, there are support groups for parents and you're in, um, Saskatchewan, right? Yep. I got to tell you, I got to brag about the uh, Saskatchewan FASD network are amazing. Hmm. Amazing. Uh, Let's see if I have their website right here. I'll give it to you later. Because we lack in a lot of other mental health things. (laughs) This isn't government based, is it? This is. uh, No. no, Okay. Well, that makes sense. (laughs) It's called the saskfasdnetwork.ca. And I'll give you the link later, but they run training all the time. They have support groups. They have fantastic booklets that they have produced that can give parents and educators um, some really good things. They've got like tips for caregivers, tips for educators, tips for employers, tips for coaches. They are brilliant. They've done really good work. Hmm at the Sask FASD network. And so, yeah, there are support groups. Um, and I'm in Alberta, I'm in Edmonton, Alberta. And in Alberta, there are 12 FASD networks. Um, and so where Saskatchewan has one network that serves the whole province, we have it broken down into 12 n- networks that serve the province in that way. And they all offer different kinds of uh, supports for families, support groups and stuff. And even if it's like the one that I know about in Edmonton is through coaching families, which is actually a Catholic social services agency, uh, but it's funded through the Edmonton fetal alcohol network. Hmm. So are, what are some of the positives you get from, from having uh, children with disability in your home? You know, my kids are fantastic. It just, we're in a hard spot right now. I have three teenagers with a disability. Like we're teenagers just Teenagers are really hard, hard enough, you know, yeah. undisabled. 
Yeah. yeah. Like, could you just put me on your prayer list? That's what I need right now. <laughs> but they're fantastic kids, you know, and they've taught me a lot. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be the person I am if I didn't have my kids. They've taught me a lot of patience. They've taught me that I'm a lot stronger than I thought I was. And my kids are strong and my kids are capable of so many amazing things. My daughters are excellent artists. They're very compassionate. They're wonderful with animals. They are, they have these funny insights. Sometimes you're just like, wow, did you just say that? Like, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. My son is an incredible athlete. If he sets his mind to it, he can do it. He taught himself how to skate. He taught himself how to rollerblade. He's taught himself how to ride a bike. He was riding a two-wheeler before he was big enough to even ride a two-wheeler. If he decides he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Um, and part of that FASD is not having any fear. So he has no fear he's going to get hurt. So here we are at the skate park and doing all these wonderful things. But he's an incredible athlete. Hmm. Do uh, like you, you kind of talked about focus. Um, is there times where they, it's, it's like almost like hyper focus on one subject or one passion? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So my girls are, my daughters who are now 17, they are all about anime. They could tell you anything and everything about anime. They can tell you more about Pokemon and Yokai watch than you'd ever want to know. Trust me. <laughs> Um, and they really focus on that. But the, that vocabulary is so complicated. All the Pokemons and all their evolutions and all this kind of stuff. Like, But they know it. They know it all and they know it inside out. It's amazing. They can play chess. Hmm. I can't play chess. They can all <laughs> play chess. Like, it's amazing. They were taught that at school. Um, yeah. And my son, like I said, he can focus on soccer. He can focus on hockey. Now, the next thing, like, it, he's really a great athlete. Hmm. Nice. Now, this is, um, you know, you don't have to answer this, <laughs> but have you ever regretted your decisions in adopting at times, you know? That's a great question. Like, no judgment here. No, 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 I hear that. You know what? I'm going to say I have not regretted, but I have been at the point where I thought I couldn't take another step. Mm -hmm. I've been at the point where I can't do this anymore. I've been there more than one time. And there's very little support for families when they're there. Cause you start phoning for help and they're like, this is just a family problem. This is, and there's just nothing. So it's really hard if you get to that point. And that's where you have to, when you can build in those other supports and structures, but it takes decades. Like I said, I've been at this for 30 years. This takes decades of work, which is why I started the podcast FASD family life. So that people who listen don't feel so alone. They know that there's another mom who's gone through all of these stages, who has lived through it, who has learned from it and who can, you know, give you a hand just to even just to be your friend, if not to give any advice, but to be your friend. There certainly have been those times where I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, and then in desperation, you know, pray to prayer, like Lord help. And there is, or Lord, give me wisdom. And there is that, and there is something, and I'm able to keep going. And I have an undying love and commitment to all five of my children. Mm -hmm. And I will, and I know that I can find what I need to find now. But I haven't known that all the way along. I can sort of relate, not in a different way that, you know, I've had moments in my life where it feels like I can't go on for a hundred percent other reasons. Yes. But, uh, you know, it's just recently that, uh, you know, I've heard the saying a thousand times, but it really hit was it's always darkest before it gets light. It's like right when you're at that breaking moment, then, you know, it starts to ease off again and. And having tools and having um, supports is... Friends and supports and knowing where to turn when you don't know where to turn. And, you know, I'm at that intersection again in my life. I'm at that intersection again. And I, I wondered whether I would say this to you today, but because this is a mental health podcast, I wanted to say that I was just riddled with anxiety just the half an hour that that third... 30 minutes right before we went on air, I was completely riddled with anxiety and feeling absolutely sick. You know how anxiety can do that to you mm -hmm. uh, because I'm at that. Mm -hmm, because you know what? This mom has depression. This mom has anxiety. This mom has PTSD. Like it's real over here. Mm -hmm. It's real. And I'm raising five kids, two are adults now, but you know, it's not been easy. We've been in high, high crisis since 2010. That's 12 years. It's a really long time to be in crisis. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I was at that point again today with a lot of anxiety. And I thought, you know what? I think that's really important to say. And the anxiety is, is I don't know what the right next, the next right step is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so what do I do? What my mental health therapist has taught me to do is like slow down and get curious. Okay. Why am I feeling anxious? I don't know what the next right step is. So it doesn't have to become this big thing. It's like, okay, I don't know what the next right step is. Who could I call? What could I do? And so that's my next right step is I'm going to start making some phone calls to say, I don't know how to do this next step of my daughters are 17. Now I, they have had uh, services for children with disabilities. That's going to expire in six months. They qualify to be adults who have disability services but there's a lot of hoops to jump through and they're formidable and I don't know how to do it. And when I don't know how to do it, I'm like that kid who's going to like put the brakes on and I'm going to look really um, defiant because I don't know how to do this. Um, And that's causing me a lot of anxiety. So what do I have to do? Just like I teach my kids, ask for help, turn to somebody. And so that's my next right move is acknowledge that I'm in over my head and try to see if there is somebody who can hold my hand and guide me through the next step. If we acknowledge where we're at, like if we, if I acknowledge I have anxiety, then suddenly that big monster of anxiety doesn't have the same hold on me as if I deny that I have anxiety. So I realized, okay, I'm feeling really anxious right now. And then instead of panicking or letting it envelop all of me, because that's what anxiety wants to do. It just wants to take over your whole life and, and make you crazy, make you so afraid. Um, so instead of doing that, if I can acknowledge, okay, I'm feeling really anxious right now. Why is that? What, wh- where could I go for help? Or just, just to be, okay, I'm feeling anxious. Just be okay with it. Mm-hmm. That's huge. Yeah. So same with people who, whatever, if it's ADHD, if it's autism, if it's fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, I have a friend, Gilberto Spencer, who lives in Australia and he has, he has all of these complexities. He has fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. He has autism. He has a crippling anxiety. He has so many depression, so many challenges, but he has recently started a podcast and he's, he's now learning to celebrate his neurodiversity and his podcast is called Wire Differently. And it's just brilliant. And I think there's just so much when we can just acknowledge that this is who we are. We're not perfect. We don't have it all together. We all struggle with something. Man, we can just be a lot kinder to ourselves and to each other. Uh, I, is, there, is there just anything else you wanted to cover? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things I want to cover just before. But I just want to share something from NoFazD Australia. So just to say that there are resources all around the world, or at least there's some work being done all around the world. And in Australia, they're doing brilliant work. So I'm going to read just briefly their statement, which says that individual fetal alcohol characteristics will vary from child to child as adverse impacts of fetal alcohol exposure are dependent on the timing and the dose of the alcohol during pregnancy. And so this does propose a conundrum for diagnosticians because of the absence of observable signs or biomarkers. And that's what you were asking me about before. Are there some other biomarkers? However, as a guide, damage to the brain means individuals living with FASD will typically experience some or all of the following characteristics. So let me just share these just really briefly. These are the primary characteristics of FASD. So these are the things that happen as a result of that prenatal alcohol exposure, memory problems, difficulty storing and retrieving information, inconsistent performance. So some good, some days a a person can demonstrate some skills and some days they can't, like maybe I can tie my right shoe, but I can't tie my left shoe could be an example. Or I can, you know, I did, I did my chores really good yesterday, but I just can't do it today. Impulsivity, distractibility, and disorganization. Ability to repeat instructions, but inability to put them into action. Difficulty with abstract thinking, like mathematics, money, time. Also abstract thinking as to what my feelings are, what the other person's feelings might be. Cognitive processing deficits, so thinking is slowed. Slower auditory pace, so may pick up only pieces of what is being said rather than the whole concept or what has been said. Developmental disability, or sorry, developmental delay, so the development is younger than the chronological age. And in children in youth, it's usually half that age. So like I said, a night an 18 year old who maybe, you know, they're ready to graduate school, ready to get that first job, maybe ready to go away to college. Like they do in the state so much developmentally, they're only nine years old. They're not ready for that yet. So think about that. Like an 18 year old, well, the last one is inability to predict outcomes or understand consequences. 
So let's go with that. Yeah. 18 has a girlfriend, has a boyfriend. What if that boyfriend or what if that girlfriend is significantly younger because you're 18, but developmentally you're more like a 10 year old. Well, what if your, what if your girlfriend is like 13 and you guys connect because you're more emotionally the same level? Well, that's a crime, right? Right. That's a crime, but cognitively, behaviorally, emotionally, you're so much the same that it, it's like, it, it fits emotionally, but it's, it's so wrong. And then also the inability to understand these concepts like, well, yeah, but I like her and she likes me and what's the problem. And then the inability to understand how about the concepts of consent? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Concepts of safe sex concepts of, you know, and, and when we say like having sex might lead to having a baby might lead to pregnancy. Well, it does sometimes and it doesn't sometimes. And that's really hard for a person who only sees things black and white. Mm -hmm. So it's very complicated, you know, and this doesn't stop at 18. That's the same for that 21 year old who has that 14 year old girlfriend, or maybe the 17 year old girl that's got maybe has a young boyfriend or, or has a college professor who she's in a relationship with because she's been able to be taken advantage of. Exactly. Because yeah. she, mm -hmm. she looks 18 has, you know, fully developed physically, but yeah. 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 And so these individuals who have FASD are, have a really high rate of having really adverse early childhood experiences. And you've probably heard about that uh, with mental health, about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, leading to some really pr problematic mental health challenges and physical health challenges later on in life. Well, people who have FASD are at a really high rate of having extraordinary numbers or high numbers of ACEs because if they're still if they're still in that family where there's alcoholism we know that's a really chaotic environment unpredictable environment maybe volatile not always but maybe a volatile environment well those are really negative those are adverse childhood experiences what if the child has to be removed from their birth mother or removed from their family that's catastrophic that that creates other challenges. What if a parent has been to jail? What if the what if the child is maybe in the care of the grandparent and their biological parent are in and out, in and out of their life because of addiction, because of criminality, because of being involved in the justice system? All of these things add up. Also, these kids are really hard to raise. They're very hard to raise. And if you don't know that you're dealing with a brain injury, what you think you're dealing with is a kid that's lazy, angry disobedient little piece of you know what and so you're going to lose your temper and you're going to be disciplining and disciplining and raging and angry and leap heaping on all these consequences if not punishment and abuse on this child because you're just so frustrated so kids who have fasd whether that's in their biological and foster home or adoptive homes aces are really high in adoptive homes and foster homes too with kids with FASD because the adoptive parents and foster parents don't know that they're dealing with a kid who has a brain injury. And so these are the kids that get moved homes and their adoptions break down. And it's just, so we know that people with aces also have really high rates of mental health challenges, addiction, um, problems in their relationships as adults. So it's, it's just a whole cascade of effect. Do you know many people that have three children with FASD in their house? There's a few of us. Is there? And it's okay. hard. There's yeah, a few of us. I was going to say, good <laughs> Lord, like one child with all, you know, with this disability would be tough enough. And I, I know people that have adopted children that aren't disabled and just the whole adoption part of it can come up and bite them in the butt sometimes. And, you know, that trauma. That's right. That's because of trauma or that's because of transracial adoptions or it's right. because of that grief and see all the, those things weren't acknowledged in the years prior, you know, in the decades previous to this, those things weren't acknowledged as, you know, like I've got my baby right from the hospital. Like I got one of my babies right from the hospital. So parents were led to believe it's not the parents fault. They were led to believe that that child hasn't, hasn't had any trauma. But of course they have. What was their whole in utero experience? Was their mother in emotional anguish because she knew she wasn't keeping this child? Mm -hmm. Was she terrified? That's going to change the baby's development. Was she using drugs or alcohol? Was she smoking? What was her, was she in an abusive situation? Like all of these things go to baby development. And then taking baby from bio mom is a huge rupture for that child. And that never goes away. And then the child grows up, even if it's 
same race. There's no racial difference. They're still growing up in a family that has a whole different genetic history. And that has implications that we used to always ignore. So that's why children and adopted family, children who are in adoption and adopted families have challenges that are very unique and very different from people who are raising their own, even kin. You know, like if you're, let's say you're raising your brother's kids or something, you still have the same family heritage. You still have all of that kind of stuff. Wow. Well, I can see why you could dedicate an entire weekly podcast to this because it's, it's complex. It's complex. And so I talk about what is FASD. I talk about some of the specific behaviors and then some of the specific helps. Like I talked about structure and routine today. I did a whole episode on routine and structure. Um, you did ask me earlier, sorry, about what some of the topics are. So, you know, what is FASD? Structure and routine, preventing um, challenging behaviors by having supportive routines. I also have a regular guest on my podcast, Dr. Jared Brown, out of the um, out of St. Paul, Minnesota. He he is an associate professor at St. Paul, Minnesota University, and he's a guest on my show every month. And he has given me wonderful episodes where we talk about um, FASD and sleep disturbances. It's such a high rate of people who have FASD who can't sleep or who can't fall asleep, can't stay asleep. Their whole thing is all turned around. That is chaos in family life too. Um, also, uh, he, he's done one on executive functioning, uh, which is a brain component, alexithymia, which is a great big word that we've talked about. And alexithymia is the inability to con connect with your own emotions and inability to kind of verbalize your emotions. I think all of us have, a, have an element of being unable to do that at times, but our kids might be unable to do that because of the brain differences in their brains. So there's a whole host of uh, resources. Um, also, I have um, Mike and Kristen Berry of Honestly Adoption as guests on the podcast. That was really fun. Lots of guests. And I have a lot of guests on my podcast who have FASD, a lot of adults who have FASD who are parenting who are not parenting, who are living in all kinds of different scenarios. And I've had them as guests on my podcast because it's so important to hear from people who have FASD themselves. They're the experts. Yeah, absolutely. What's the podcast name again? FASD Family Life. Where can you find it? Everywhere. It is everywhere. It's on Apple. It's on iHeartRadio. It's on Audible. It's everywhere you want. It's Amazon Podcast. Anywhere you want to find a podcast, it's there. It's the FASD Family Life with Robbie Seal. Oh,